Let's hear it for our home team. Aren't we proud? Yeah, we are. So Palm Sunday, the day where we uh, shout in victory and Hosanna, it is the day that Jesus stood out in many ways and on many levels. Um, to stand out in a crowd means that you're willing to be the center of attention, that you, uh, you stand out in a crowd because you have a song to sing or you have something to say or a special talent. And maybe you were raised not to draw too much attention to yourself, but there are times when we need to stand out, right, and to be seen and to be heard. And this was Jesus on Palm Sunday. His reputation preceded him, and it was his time. He fed the crowd's expectation of his public persona as the Messiah who has come to save them from the oppression of Rome. And so he tells his disciples to go and bring me a cult, knowing that as he says this, that he is fulfilling a prophecy that the Israel lights knew about and had known for generations, which is found in the book of Zechariah, chapter 9, verse 9. Rejoice greatly, daughter of Zion. Shout, daughter of Jerusalem. See your king comes to you, righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. So he rides this cult into Jerusalem, and as he does so, he is fulfilling the prophecy, and they, they throw their cloaks in front of him, they raise their palm branches, and they say, Hosanna in the highest, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, peace in heaven, glory in the highest, and the Pharisees say, tell him, tell your people to be quiet. You know, they don't want to draw attention to themselves because the Romans might notice and the Romans might get angry. And he said, even if I tell them to be silent, even the stones would cry out. So it's almost like this, this moment has been waiting to come and, and, and there's, no, there's no stopping it. There's also a metaphor here that's happening as he rides the colt into Jerusalem. And that is that, imagine, I mean, any baby, whether it's a human or an animal, is pretty uncontrollable, isn't it? I mean, you can't control your puppy. It's hard to control a toddler. And now imagine he has a, a colt, a, a baby donkey. Imagine how uncontrollable that is. And yet he gets on it and he rides into Jerusalem and... And the symbology behind that is, I think, that he has started this process of which he cannot control. He cannot control the crowds. He can't control this situation that he is stepping into, and he has to let go. And so this takes us to where we left off the last couple of weeks, which is chapter 2 in the book, The Way of the Pilgrim, which is about the practice of packing lightly. And over the last couple of weeks, we've talked about what does that mean, the practice of packing lightly. It means to let go. It means letting go of possessions, letting go of old ideas that no longer serve us, letting go of relationships that no longer serve us, and the real big one, which is letting go of control, right? Ugh. It's the third step in the 12-step program. And so Jesus is letting go of control as he steps into this situation. Now, we've talked about the different things that we need to let go of as a community as we, uh, as we go through this uh, building reconstruction. And so we're walking through this process of releasing and letting go of objects so that we can let go of who we are so, we can be, so that we can set ourselves up for who we might become. Palm Sunday is the beginning of a great transformation. This is the beginning of Holy Week. This is the beginning of this great story of transformation that lives in us and it lives in, uh, in history. It lives in ancient times over and over again in different ways the story um, is told. In the book that Scott gave me called Managing Transitions by William and Susan Bridges, um, again, I want to remind us that there are three stages 
to a transition, and I don't think that we can hear this enough as we go through our building process together. And the first is that we're letting go of the old ways and the old identity that we had. And so part of this is telling stories, it's releasing, and one of the things that we've been doing to release is that we've been blessing different rooms in the building. We've been blessing the, the chapel and the offices upstairs to thank them and to bless them. And so today, there is a blessing of the lobby. So I invite you to join with that after church that uh, Annie and Dee Dee will be leading that and you can, you know, share memories of all the conversations that imagine that have taken place in that lobby. And then we go through the second stage, which is the in-between period, which is when the old is gone, but the new is not yet formed, and that's the most creative place, and that's where Jesus goes when he's in the, when he, when he's in the tomb, right? When he descends into uh, the underworld, if you will, and so that's that place where we get uh, reimagined, reformed, and then the third stage is to come out of the transition is a new beginning, and it's when people develop a new identity, experience a new energy, discover a new purpose, and yet we still have to go through those other stages. So Jesus, at this moment, is now at the beginning of the end. So what looked like a beginning is the end. What looks like a success later might look like a failure. And some of those things that look like a failure are actually a success. That ever happened to you? Where you thought, man, this is like the biggest failure I've ever had in my life, and it turns out not so bad. You know, it turns out to be a success. It turns out to be a beginning. Or perhaps you've had some great success in life, and, and, and then for it to turn into something else. And really, life is, is circular. It's, it's a spiral. It's, it's constantly changing and moving, and nothing ever stays the same. So we're moving from one to the other. So what I see happening here today on so many levels is that Jesus is standing in his authenticity. He is standing out by being willing to be public and to be seen, because up to this point, he's always disappearing. Whenever, you know, especially the Pharisees or the guards are coming, he, he kind of disappears. But this time, he stands in public. He stays still, and he is standing out because he also is really standing outside of the crowd. So he's standing out in two ways. One, he's standing out, he's being seen. But the other thing is that he's not really being seen for what, he's, what his message is and what he's saying because he's talking about an inner kingdom instead of an outer kingdom that everyone else is thinking about. So he's also standing outside of the crowd at the same time. So in this story of triumphal entry, we see that Jesus is a master of authenticity, and the word author and authenticity have similar roots. Now, to live authentically means to have the inside of you match the outside, to say what you mean, to follow through with it, to let go of pretense, of peer pressure, of wanting to please others right? So it's, it's like being who you really are. What is that phrase? What you think of me is none of my business, right? It's, it's standing in that. Maya Angelou said it this way. She said, you are only free when you realize you belong no place. You belong every place. No place at all. The price is high. The reward is great. So, what is she saying? You are only free when you realize you belong no place, but you belong every place. And the truth is, who do you belong to? You belong to yourself, right? You belong to God. And so, when we can stand in that, that this is who I am, and I stand in myself, I stand with this, then I can be no place and I can be every place. And sometimes, the price is great because we all want to fit in, right? We all want to be approved of. We all want to join in. We all want to be a part of the group. And yet there are times when we're called to stand outside of that to be our own self. Brene Brown wrote a book called Braving the Wilderness. And the whole book really is about standing outside and being your authentic self and speaking that. And I want to share with you what she says. Bringing yourself, 
bringing so fully to yourself, this is authenticity, bringing so fully to yourself that you are willing to stand alone in the wilderness, an untamed, unpredictable place of solitude and searching. The wilderness can feel unholy because we can't control it. There's that word again. We can't control it. True belonging is a spiritual practice of believing in and belonging to yourself so deeply that you can share your most authentic self with the world and find sacredness in both being a part of something and standing alone in the wilderness. True belonging doesn't require you to change who you are. It requires you to be who you are. I think we saw a great example of this yesterday with the March for Our Lives movement, right? Yesterday we saw many children standing out in a crowd. And what makes this movement different is that Parkland is joining with all the victims of gun violence across the nation. They're not just limiting it to their self. A, a man by the name of uh, Dan Cullen, he survived the Columbine shooting, has since become a writer for Vanity Fair, and his lot in life has been to go to high school, to high school, to high school, to high school, and to cover these shootings, and it costs him, you know, it drains him like crazy. And he said this is the first time where he's felt energized. Yes, there's the grief and the sadness and the shock, but he said, this one is different. He said, they really see the bigger picture. They know that there's more power if they join their forces with kids from Chicago and everywhere, and that's where the victory is. Because it isn't just about one place, it's about all, right? And they're all standing in that. And so yesterday, I don't know how many of you participated or saw, but there were 800,000 people uh, who marched in Washington, D.C. Um, in Seattle, it was tens of thousands. Uh, across the nation, the numbers are about a million plus around the world. And the chant is basically never again and enough is enough. Those are the things that we heard over and over again. And as I watched... I mean, a couple things happened as I was watching this. One is I just took a deep breath and a sigh of relief. It was like, wow, you know, we can pass the torch over. There's a new generation that's stepping up to this that, 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 that was so powerful and it was so amazing, really. And as I watched the different speeches yesterday, there were three that stood out for me and probably stood out for the rest of the nation. And the first, of course, is Emma Gonzalez and her six minutes and 20 seconds. Did anybody see that? Did anybody watch that? Uh, Google it and watch it. It's worth seeing. It is, I thought about showing it here, but, it, but anyway, you can Google it and you can watch it. And Emma Gonzalez um, came out and she... she shared the names of the 17 students who were, who were killed. And she talked about how they would be missed. It was very short. And then she, after she said all of their names and things that they would never do again, she stood there in front of 800,000 people plus millions on television, and she stood there and held the space. And at first, the crowd didn't know what she, well, I don't think the crowd knew what she was doing until she was done. But she just stood there, and tears were running down her face as she held the space. I mean, what power, what authenticity to hold the space. And people were, like, thinking that she forgot what she was going to say, so they're applauding her, they're calling her name, saying, we love you, and she held the space. And then the kids who were on the stage over here started chanting, enough's enough, or whatever they were chanting, and then they caught that for a while, and then it died out. And then finally, people sort of fell into silence. And then you hear a timer go off at six minutes and 20 seconds. And she turns off the timer. And she says six minutes and 20 seconds is how long it took the shooter to kill 17 people and injure how many others. And that we have to fight and, and, and walked off. And it was so powerful and it was so amazing um, that you can't not be touched by, by something like that, and especially at her youth. Now, how is it that an 18-year-old can stand in such authenticity? So she is um, the president of the Gay-Straight Alliance at her school. 
And she said that if I wasn't so open about who I was, I would never be able to do this. So we see a, a young woman who has already practiced authenticity. She's already practiced in showing up and this is who I am, like it or not, and so she can hold that space. The other speaker who was very profound was a nine-year-old, right? Nine-year-old, um, no, an 11-year-old, sorry, there's another, there's a nine-year-old as well. 11-year-old Naomi Wadler came out and she too was eloquent, eloquent and amazing. I, I was blown away by these kids. And again, I have to share her words. She said, I'm here today to acknowledge and represent the African American girls whose stories don't make the front page of every national newspaper. I represent the African American women who are victims of gun violence, who are simply statistics instead of brought vibrant, beautiful girls who are full of potential. For far too long, these names, these black girls and women have been just numbers, and I'm here to say, never again, for these girls too. People said that I'm too young to have these thoughts on my own, but it's not true. My friends and I might still be 11, and we might still be in elementary school, but we know that life isn't equal for, any, for, for everyone, and we know what is right and what is wrong. And then she finished it up by saying, and in seven years, we'll all be able to vote, you know? <laughs> and for me, the third speaker was, was Yolanda Renee King. She is the great-granddaughter of Martin Luther King and Coretta Scott King. And this little nine-year-old came out, and boy, does she have the speaking DNA, right? The speaking genes. She's got it. You could just see her coming out and holding that space. And she says, you know, my grandfather had a dream that his four little children would not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. And she said, I have a dream that enough is enough, and that this should be a gun-free world. And... Then she led 800,000 people in a chant. Spread the word, have you heard, all across the nation, we are, going to be, uh, we are going to be a great generation. Spread the word, have you heard, all across the nation, we're gonna be a great generation. And she got, she got 800,000 people to chant this together and it's like, oh yeah, you are your, your grandpa's <laughs> uh, child. And, what to me, one of the things that was so powerful about this was she speaking the truth, right? That this is a great generation that's coming forward, that their voices are being heard. And yeah, now it's a gun violence. I don't think it's going to be silent on just about anything. And the way they're showing up with love and compassion and kindness and inclusivity, I mean, you know, it's, 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 it's just so powerful and it's so great to see. So, so as they were all chanting, we're the next, you know, we're a great generation, it's like, yeah, yeah, you are. And, and she's calling that out. So how are the kids like Jesus? Well, number one, their authenticity. They stood in authenticity. Um, they're being told by the powers that be that they can't do anything to change things, um, and yet they're standing and they're being heard anyway. Emma said that it is probably going to be years, and at this point I don't, I don't know and I don't mind. It, nothing is that, that's, is, that is difficult um, is going to be easy. And she goes, we're going against the largest gun lobby, and we could very well die trying to do this, but we could also die not trying. So when we look at the phases of the letting go, of the in-between place and the starting over, we're in the letting go phase right now. This is the beginning of the end. A new generation is stepping forward. The old way and the old stories need to be let go. And so like Jesus on Palm Sunday, we're seeing this beginning of the end, and so we stand with them. You know, we stand with them in prayer, and we stand with them in action. And I want to call out Troy, um, who is leading the Seattle Peace Project. Troy, would you just sort of wave your hand and so people can see you? 
Um, he is uh, available following the service leading a discussion group, and he has created an app so that uh, we can meditate and because we're not letting go of prayer. I know thoughts and prayers aren't enough, but we're not letting go of prayer, and that, that's kind of our generator that we do here at Seattle Unity. And so um, I invite you to join him and to talk with him and to meet with him, to be a part of that so we can stand behind these kids, not only with our action, but with our prayers and our support. So let's close with a prayer and bring this into a deeper place. So I invite you to become quiet, to become still. And I invite you to take a deep breath. And as we move into prayer, may our insides, our inside thoughts and feelings be reflected in the outside. May who we are be in divine alignment with, which, with that which we project into the world, which that which we give to the world. You are loved beyond measure. You are unique. So I invite you to stand out just as Jesus did and to stand up in your own unique way. In our spiritual nature, we recognize the Christ spirit when it appears in our consciousness for we are uplifted. We are filled with a sense of praise as we know that when the Spirit enters our lives, transformation takes place. So may this be our victory. May this be our standing out to be seen, to be heard, for the good of all humanity, for the good of all beings with kindness and compassion. And for this awareness, and in the name and through the power of the living spirit of truth, we say thank you and amen.